Welcome, welcome, welcome. So I am just delighted to welcome all of you to tonight's talk um, with Judy Wicks. My name is Jenny Mish. I know many of you and I want to welcome every single one of you very warmly and enthusiastically. I'm an alum of this business school. This, um, here we are at the Uni University of Montana Gallagher School of Business and I did my MBA here. Um, graduated in 2003 and then went and did a PhD at the University of Utah in sustainability and business. And then I was on faculty at the University of Notre Dame for four years doing research and teaching in sustainability and business. And I, I missed Missoula. I miss the mountains and I miss the community. And I love this place and I know you do too. And I, I, I bet you're here because you love it as much as I do, that you love our community and our place. So I believe in Missoula. I'm the executive director now of the Sustainable Business Council in Missoula. And um, our mission is to <coughs> advance a vibrant local economy built on sustainable practices. So um, advancing a vibrant local economy built on sustainable practices is something you're going to hear a lot about in this lecture. And I trust that you're going to get more enthusiastic about it as the evening progresses. Um, I would like to say that we're in an exciting period of organizational um, growth and development. And I'd like to um, introduce our board members. Um, we have uh, a wonderful um, group of, of especially new uh, executive committee right now, Heather Stokes. Would you all like to come up? Come, so board, come up here to the board members, please. This is Heather Stokes, and she's our new chair of the board, and Rod Austin is the vice chair of the board, and Joni Walker is our secretary. And we also are, are fortunate to have Lori Bridge Strand Bridgman, Lori Strand Bridgman, excuse me, um, and Rebecca McClellan, and um, Caroline Sims and J.R. Plate. So this is the team that I get to work with. Um, and I also get to work with Sue Anderson, who many of you have met, and Lisa Hensley. It's a fantastic team. And we have some amazing interns. Stephanie Rawls, Nate Bender, Jesse Roberts are all working with us this semester. And we're looking for new interns for the summer and the fall. So if you're students and, and interested in what we do, please send me a, uh, an email. And um, so thank you all for your service and for, for being here and welcoming everybody. Thank you. There, on, on the back tables coming in, you should get a program and um, also a list of upcoming events. Um, there's a lot of um, tap nights coming up and networking events and other things. I just want to draw your attention to a few things coming up that are really exciting. And the first one that's most important to say tonight is that tomorrow morning we have another event with Judy Wicks at the loft of Missoula um, from 8 to 9.30 with snacks from Bernice's Bakery. And um, it'll be a panel with um, highlighting three of our local entrepreneurs as well as Judy. So that's going to be featuring um, Mark Vandermeer from Bad Goat Forest Products and Carol Lynn Lopatka, who helped to start um, the Maid Fair in Missoula, and her business is called Recreate Designs, and our very own um, Paul Gladen, who is, as many of you probably know, the new director of the Launchpad in Initiative here at the University of Montana, and he's also an entrepreneur um, running a business called Muse, Muse View. So that's tomorrow morning. I hope everybody can join us um, uh, at 8 o'clock and have some snacks and hear um, a panel. Um, also, on April 23rd, we're going to show a film at the Roxy called The Greening, Greening of Southie, which is a fun film about how a group of construction workers grapple with what it means to, to have sustainability in building um, as they build a, a, a gold lead um, condominium complex. So it's, it's got some humor in it and it's like, how do you, you know, get to know the idea of sustainability and come around to really thinking, hey, this is a good thing. So that, that should be a fun film. Um, and also, on May 8th, 
We are co-sponsoring with CFAC, the Community Food and Agriculture Coalition, a pitch fest, a farm fresh pitch fest. So we're gonna feature four to seven food and farm businesses who will get to um, give a five minute pitch about their business and tell us about their business, about their innovations, their ideas to improve the food system um, through their entrepreneurship. So those are some fun things coming up. Also this summer we're planning to ask Missoulians to make a 10% commitment to purchase 10% of your food um, budget from local pr producers and suppliers. And uh, so you'll be hearing more about that. So we've got lots of exciting things. So um, I uh, also want to thank our sponsors for this series of wonderful events with Judy Wicks. Um, she visited an MBA class here today and we went to lunch. And so there's been a bunch of different pieces of this, um, this visit. And uh, we are really grateful to have Axiom IT Solutions sponsoring this event and Balance Tech LLC um, and the Missoulian and Mamalode. Um, the University of Montana has been our partner in doing these annual lectures for a number of years and we're really grateful for that. We also got sponsorship this year from UM Dining Services, which is a separate entity on its own, and so we're grateful for that. Um, we uh, appreciate the Green Light and First Interstate Bank, and the Missoula Independent and the Good Food Store, and Cherry Creek Radio, and of course, the Buttercup Market and Cafe, where some of you just enjoyed a reception, um, and the Loft of Missoula. And I think I mentioned everybody, so. Um, Thanks to all of those sponsors. We really appreciate it. So, with those preliminaries, after those preliminaries, I want to say that um, I've really enjoyed hanging out with Judy Wicks um, since she came in yesterday. And um, she is somebody who Inc. Magazine has um, recognized as one of their 25 most fascinating entrepreneurs. And in particular, she is recognized as putting into place more social benefits per square foot than any other entrepreneur so by Inc. Magazine. So that says a lot right there. <laughs> she's started several businesses and she'll tell the stories of those, but she's best known for um, operating the White Dog Cafe. Um, she's also a sustainability activist and author. Her new book is called um, Good Morning Beautiful Business and she'll be signing copies of that in the lobby afterwards and again tomorrow morning at the loft after the panel. Um, most importantly, I think um, Judy's a fantastic uh, representation of the kind of ingenuity and creativity um, that small business people bring to their work every day all over the country and that we have a lot of here in Missoula. And that's what really builds a vibrant local economy. And I know many of you are small businesses and I hope that you will be inspired as I have been um, by Judy's role in developing her business and then in developing her supply chain and in developing um, the sustainable business network of greater Philadelphia and then building the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, BALLE, B-A-L-L-E, which is the national organization that we are members of. And so she's a real hero of local living economies. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Judy Wicks. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Jenny, for harnessing me. And, <laughs> and thank you to the um, uh, Sustainable Business Council, uh, my friend uh, Don McGee and uh, Sue Anderson and Jenny for uh, bringing me to Missoula. And I'm having a good time here. It's a great city. It's my first time in Missoula, and I'm very impressed. Uh, I love all the small businesses. How many people here are owners of small businesses in this town? Wow, look at that. Well, congratulations to all of you. You're the foundation of this uh, community. Um, and I'm just so impressed at the number of independent local businesses and um, also the, the budding uh, local food movement. Uh, so uh, congratulations to all of you for all the work you're doing. Um, so. Uh, there I am when I'm a, a little bit younger. <laughs> but, uh, my book, uh, Good Morning Beautiful Business, got its name uh, from a sign uh, that I used to have in my closet when I lived above the White Dog Cafe, which I did for many years. I lived in the same house for 38 years. And when I would open my closet in the morning, I would see a sign that said, Good Morning Beautiful Business. 
And it was a reminder to me of just how beautiful business is. When we put our creativity and our care and our uh, love and energy into producing a product or a service that we then offer uh, to our community. I'm sure many of you are also beautiful business owners. Uh, so it would be a time of the day that I would think about my own business and how the farmers were out in the fields picking organic fruits and vegetables to bring into town that day. I would think of the farm animals out in pasture and sunshine and fresh air. Uh, my goat herder, uh, Dougie, uh, she would say that when she kissed her goat's ears, it made the cheese better. Uh, so I think that's true. So for me, uh, business is about relationships. Money is simply a tool. Business is about relationships uh, with everybody that we buy from and sell to and work with and about our relationship with Earth uh, itself. Um, my business was the way that I expressed my love of life uh, and that's what made it uh, a thing of beauty. So uh, let me put on my glasses and I'll, uh, is, is it, uh, can everybody hear me well? Okay, good. Um, so I will um, read a passage from the preface, the end of the preface, to give you kind of an overview of the book. This book is both a love story and a business book. It's about a love of life, nature, animals, community, and unique local culture. A love of good food and family farms, and a love of democracy all being threatened by a global economic system driven by profit. It's also about a deep love of business and how we can embrace a way of doing business that is beautiful, that nurtures all that we cherish, and that furthers the creation of a whole new economic system based on caring relationships. Though this new economy is global in vision, my story and the story for each of us begins right at home in our own community and with our own capacity to recognize and protect what we truly care about. So this was my first community, my first place. Uh, am I standing in the way of anybody? Can you see the picture? I don't know where I can, maybe over here. There. Is that good? Okay. <laughs> so uh, this is my small town of Ingemar in western Pennsylvania, north of Pittsburgh. Um, and this was the Ingemar beer distributor. This was on the busiest corner in town because that's where the beer distributor was. <laughs> Uh, and the beers that were sold there um, back when I was growing up in the 50s uh, were local beers, Iron City from Pittsburgh and um, Rolling Rock from nearby Latrobe. The Fire Hall, the Ingemar Fire Hall, where I learned to do my first rock and roll dance. Uh, and the volunteer firemen were all the small business owners, you know, of the, the businesses in my town. And it was in Ingemar that I witnessed the role of small business uh, owners um, in community life. I would go with my mother or grandmother to the butcher and the butcher would always say, well, how was that steak from last Saturday night? Uh, because they knew where it came from and they wanted to see how it compared with the last week or whatever. Um, there was a drugstore right across the street from the fire hall uh, where my dad used to go after he was retired. He would co have coffee at the, at the counter there uh, every morning and uh, they had cups with everybody's name on it. Uh, so it was that kind of small town atmosphere uh, where I'm, I'm sure you recognize the benefits uh, here in Missoula, although Ingemar was much smaller than Missoula. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. These are the foundational relationships uh, in, a, in a small, uh, in a community. So I had that benefit of witnessing that as a child. So the next really important experience for me, I'm leaving college out, it wasn't all that relevant. I learned how to drink beer, <laughs> and dance, you know. Uh, anyway, after I graduated from college in 1969, uh, I joined VISTA, uh, Volunteers in Service to America, uh, and my first husband, uh, my childhood sweetheart, and I uh, went to Alaska to serve for a year living in an Eskimo village. And it was here that I witnessed um, indigenous life uh, uh, and how that differed from my own consumer culture. Uh, Eskimos, their culture has lasted for thousands of years and it's based on cooperation and sharing. Uh, and I saw that in comparison that my own culture is based on competition and hoarding. Uh, how much can we accumulate? Uh, so uh, as an example of their traditions, um, 
uh, is a seal party. I had a, a woman came and knocked on my door one spring morning and she was beckoning, seal party, seal party. And so I followed along and found out that the, that the tradition is that after a long, hard winter, when a man catches his first seal of the season, his wife has a seal party and she invites all the women of the village over to their home and they, just, they divide the meat and the blubber, as you can see in these big pails here, uh, between all the families. And then anything else that the family has accumulated during the year is also uh, redistributed uh, to, to the community. Uh, so the women are tying up uh, goodies in their skirts. Uh, it might be buttons or a can, uh, a can good or fabric or, or whatever. Uh, but everything is shared. And then the ending ceremony is to throw hard candy and bubble gum and stuff up into the air and the women all uh, catch it in their skirts. And I was right out there uh, trying to get uh, fireballs and root beer barrels and whatnot. It wasn't a lot of entertainment up there. <laughs> uh, so uh, I saw how um, there was no sense of envy um, in the Eskimo uh, village. You know, if I said, uh, boy, I like that purplish blouse you have. If you were an Eskimo, you would give it to me. Uh, but please don't. Uh, <laughs> I've, I have accumulated a few things in that way. Uh, you have to watch out what you admire when you're around Eskimos. Um, so I could see that in my own culture, uh, envy really drives our economy through advertising, that advertisers make you feel envious, make us all feel envious of the glamorous models or the macho guys, you know, to buy this beer or the cigarette, this car, this fashion, this lipstick or whatever, uh, and making us feel like we never have enough. So our identity is really based on, you know, for many people on, on what we buy and what we have. Um, so uh, w with the Eskimos, uh, th because they don't really have any concept of, of, of taking more than they need, uh, I saw in my own culture that we actually admire the most people who hoard the most. Uh, where Eskimos can't even conceive of this, we actually reward the, uh, people who are greedy. We admire the most the ones who have the most stuff, the biggest houses, the biggest wardrobes, the most number of cars, you know, and so on. Um, and, and yet, um, the Eskimos were the happiest people that I've ever met. Uh, and I realized, in hindsight, that the reason was because they didn't base their happiness and their sense of security on how much money was in the bank and how much stuff they had in their house, uh, their security and their happiness was based on community. Uh, and that's something that we often have lost touch with in our uh, very mobile contemporary society. So uh, this is a little off or something, but I guess it doesn't really matter. Anyway, <laughs> my, my first uh, business, after I came back from the Alaska uh, village, my first hus husband and I moved to Philadelphia to start this store called the Free People's Store. Um, and it was, um, we only had $3,000, which was $1,500 each uh, stipend uh, from Vista. Um, and we used our ingenuity uh, to buy things. Um, this is a pair of long underwear. I opened the flap in the back for our open and close sign. Uh, but the underwear was a great um, uh, item for us. Uh, we mostly sold the, the, just the tops with the little three buttons here. And we bought them just the plain white underwear for, I don't know, like $1.25 or something. And then we dyed them and sold them for six bucks. And um, you see this little sign in the window there, records 275. That's called a lost leader. We found out from our friend who was going to Wharton. So we would sell records uh, at wholesale cost for 275. So all the students from the University of Pennsylvania would come flooding in to get the 275 uh, dollar records and buy other stuff. Um, so that's how we, that's how we started. Uh, we had no money for uh, fixtures, um, so we went to Chinatown on garbage day and collected these wooden crates that were used to ship goods from China uh, to Philadelphia. Uh, my hobby as a child was building forts up in the woods, so I took all these uh, wooden crates and created shelves from them and painted them these primary colors. Back in 1970, when we started the store, um, we believed, as most of us hipsters from the 60s baby boom era folks did, that you can't trust anyone over 30. So we decided that we would only sell to people under 30. Uh, so <laughs> our merchandise was all stuff that we liked. You know, uh, Our market was our, our friends, our, our age group, the, you know, the dangly earrings, the incense, the candles, the baskets, the frisbees, uh, the mattress uh, bedspreads, the coffee mugs, uh, Mexican hand-blown glasses, you know, the stuff. <laughs> uh, and uh, also a lot of clothes. Um, again, we used recycled items for our fixtures. Here's a, a, a wooden um, spool that's used for electric company cords to go around. And that was the center table for t-shirts and jeans and whatnot. That's me taking my picture in the mirror uh, wearing my bell-bottom jeans, macrame belts, 
uh, paper lanterns, uh, kind of hippie clothes. Um, so I'll uh, read you a passage from uh, this part of my life. In the beginning, we couldn't afford uh, jeans from a big brand name like Levi Strauss and Company because we couldn't make the minimum order. All we could afford was to buy three pairs in three sizes from a lesser known brand. Once we splurged and bought three pairs of purple velvet bell-bottom jeans, a big investment for us. They were the most expensive items in the store, and we were eager to sell them so we could buy six more pairs, then 12, and so on. The purple velvet jeans led to something we hadn't yet thought about. One day, when I was in the store alone, a group of 10 or 12 high school girls descended on the store all at once. I was trying desperately to keep my eyes on each of them as they asked me questions to draw me to different parts of the store. Suddenly, they all left as they had come at once. And I noticed with dismay as they hurried out the door that one of the girls was wearing a pair of the purple velvet jeans. Stop, they're my jeans, I cried out. And they took off running. I locked the door and gave chase. Up the street and around the corner we went, dodging traffic across a busy thoroughfare. I was gaining ground and as the group reached the parking lot of the supermarket at the corner of 44th and Walnut, I lunged and tackled the culprit to the ground. <laughs> Without thinking, I unzipped the jeans and yanked them off her. <laughs> As she lay on the sidewalk on her underpants screaming, I ran back to the store and triumphantly returned our pur purple velvet jeans to the shelf. <laughs> I was determined that we would sell that pair and more and more and more until someday Levi Strauss and company would be very glad to sell to us. <laughs> so as it turned out, Levi Strauss was very glad to sell to us because the store, uh, the Free People store, uh, grew up to become Urban Outfitters, uh, which is a huge international chain that does several billion dollars uh, <laughs> worth of sales. Uh, but after a couple of years, um, I needed to leave uh, the marriage, and you'll have to read the book to find out why. It's a really good story. Uh, but um, I, I decided to leave, um, and I'll read you um, a passage from that period. My, hu my husband's name was uh, Dick Hain, and he's still the CEO of uh, Urban Outfitters, uh, which en encompasses um, uh, the Urban Outfitters chain, the Free People's chain, um, uh, anthropology chain and a garden uh, supply chain called uh, Terrain. Uh, but the Free People store is not, this store was the prototype for Urban Outfitters, not for the store that's now called Free People. Dick's and my lives were, uh, would take drastically different turns. He continued on with the Free People store and I had no idea where life was leading when I packed my bags and left my husband home and business. I got only a block away when I ran a red light and collided with another car. Luckily no one was hurt but the car I was using could not be driven. A passerby offered to help me home. But I can't go home. I've just left my husband. My bags are packed and I've got to keep going, I poured out as we stood on the sidewalk. And now I have to find a job fast because I need money to repair the car. Maybe I can help, said the passerby, a very friendly, blonde, curly-haired young man about my age. I work in a restaurant called La Terrasse on the 3400 block of Sansom Street near the university. And they have an opening for a waitress. I'll take it. I said immediately, as if I were talking to the person who was hiring me. <laughs> and so that's how I got into the restaurant business that would be my life for the next 40 years, quite by accident. <laughs> so moving right along, uh, this is the 3400 block of Sanson Street. It's a very old watercolor and probably 100 years old, but it gives you the idea of this beautiful block of Victorian uh, brownstone row houses. Uh, where I took the job as a waitress. Um, over a 10 year period, I became the general manager, then a partner in the business, and, and so on. And the block was going to be torn down. And um, so I joined the fight uh, to save these buildings from being torn down because I found that uh, they were going to build a mall in the place of these buildings. And I, I think this was my first uh, Bali moment when I found out that uh, these uh, buildings with the independent small businesses on the first floor and residents above would be evicted and torn down. Uh, to make way for a mall of fast food restaurants uh, and chain stores. Uh, so I ended up lying down in front of a bulldozer um, and they came to tear down the buildings behind us. Uh, that story uh, is in the book. Uh, but anyway, eventually we prevailed. And, uh, but I decided that this is the place where I wanted to live and work and raise my family. Uh, and I feel like that's the first uh, step uh, in building a sustainable local economy, or a living economy as we call it, Bali, uh, meaning that we're supporting, we have businesses that support both natural life and community life. Um, so it was here that I put my stake in the ground. Uh, this is the place that I'm going to take responsibility for and uh, become knowledgeable of. 
So we won the block fight, um, and those of us on the committee to save the block were given the first rights to buy our houses. So I bought the house that I had moved into uh, 10 years before um, uh, and uh, started the White Dog on the first floor, 3420 Sansom Street. And in the beginning, I didn't have much money, so I started as a, a muffin shop, a muffin and coffee takeout shop. We didn't even have any tables and chairs in the very beginning. Uh, then when I wanted to start serving hot food, I couldn't afford to put the exhaust fans up through the house. So I put a charcoal grill in the backyard. Um, here's the chef out there. And then when it got to be cold, we actually built a tent of, out of plastic around the, the grill. Uh, I was begging the chef, please stay through New Year's Eve because I have to have a restaurant on New Year's Eve. Uh, and at that point, it was a guy who was very begrudg begrudgingly stayed uh, wearing his parka and boots and mitts and hat and everything out in this plastic tent cooking for New Year's Eve. And then the next day, he quit. Uh, and I didn't have the, uh, the nerve to put an ad in the paper uh, for a chef and then take them out back to show them this grill out in the snow, you know. Um, <laughs> So I closed uh, briefly, um, and uh, my girlfriend sold her beach house and uh, loaned me some money to put in an indoor uh, kitchen. Um, so oh, in those days, though, uh, before that time, we, it was a very um, unusual place. Uh, the dishwasher was a three-bowl sink in the corner of the dining room. When you finished your plates, uh, your meal, you'd pass your dirty plates over the dishwasher, and he would wash them right there in the dining room while he chatted uh, with you. Uh, if you uh, wanted to uh, use the restroom, uh, you were directed to go upstairs to my house uh, where you would wave to my kids as you made your way to the family bathroom. Uh, so we were just like kind of one step ahead, uh, ahead of the local officials, uh, you know, in terms of our uh, meeting code. Uh, but we m grew fast enough where we, we just kept, uh, we got, a, got the bathroom in at the nick of time and that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, here was our... Uh, most popular dining room in the summertime it was right next to the charcoal grill, an outdoor dining room. We put a little white picket, picket fence. It was very, very charming uh, until a big rat would run through because we're in the city and you can't really uh, uh, help that. Um, so we would just instruct the uh, waitress, uh, waitresses to say, there goes another bunny. Uh, <laughs> so we grew and prospered and eventually uh, built this dining room over top of the, uh, the old uh, pa uh, outdoor patio, and a, a two-tiered uh, dining room. So eventually we sat to, uh, 200 people and grew the business to a uh, $5 million uh, business. Um, so um, one of the most important things was getting our liquor license. Um, and I'll, I'll read you, um, this is Carol Stout, who owns uh, Stout Brewing Company uh, in Reading, PA. And I'll read you a little bit about that. I had, um, you know, like most of us, uh, you know, before 1980 or so, uh, the beers that we knew were the kind of beers that were sold in Ingemar when I grew up, like Budweiser and Iron City and so on, uh, tasteless, watery beers. Uh, and I happened to be in San Francisco and um, had the opportunity to try Anchor Steam. Anyone here ever had Anchor Steam? It's such a great beer. And I was just blown away because it was the first good beer I ever had. And I couldn't wait to get my liquor license so I could have Anchor Steam. Uh, and the White Dog was the first business in, in um, Philadelphia to, to carry Anchor Steam and the second restaurant on the East Coast. Um, so this was back in 1985. I was finally able to begin serving the new American beers I was longing for, you know, when I got my liquor license. Customers were surprised when they came into the bar and ordered a popular beer like Heineken to be told that we didn't carry the brand. Then how about a Lohenbrau? Nope. Well, then I'll take a Michelob. Not that either. Then just give me a Bud. Sorry, but how about one of these beers? Handing over our beer list, mighty short at the time, the bartender explained that the White Dog carried only beers from small independent breweries, later called craft or microbrews, that brewed beer in small batches. I soon discovered that unlike wine, beer is best when fresh and without the preservatives needed for long distance shipping, just like local food. So I upped the ante. Not only did I want flavorful, all-American beer, I became determined to have beer that was local, fresh, and made without preservatives. So I was thrilled to hear in 1987 that an excellent new brewery had opened just 60 miles to the west in Adamstown. It was not only the first new brewery in Pennsylvania since Prohibition, but it was owned by a woman. I immediately called up the owner, Carol Stout. That's her. <laughs> and asked about ordering her beer. At first, Carol thought 60 miles was too far for her beer to travel. She was in the local too. But I convinced her to sell to me. And she drove into town with a keg strapped into the passenger seat with the seat belt. <laughs> we laughed about that years later when Carol was celebrating the 20th anniversary of Stouts Brewery after winning many a gold medal at the Great American Beer Festival. It wasn't long before Stouts began brewing our private label beer 
which I called leg lifter lager. And I, I drew this label uh, for the beer. Uh, I, I love to do little drawings of dogs and so on. So, uh, and I, uh, we, I also uh, decorated our bathrooms. I, I called the bathrooms a pointers and setters. And the pointers in the male bathroom, the setters, if you will. And I did uh, drawings on the wall. And the pointers bathroom, I had a uh, dog lifting his leg you know, on a tree and a little group of ladybugs trying to pull their picnic out of the way. And, uh, and then I had a, a setter's bathroom with a, a poodle primping herself. Uh, and she had a little bottle of perfume on her dresser that said, Essence of Dead Squirrel. Because uh, my dogs always, you know how they love to you know, rub their necks you know, on dead stuff. Um, so anyway, I had a lot of fun with dog drawings and whatnot. Uh, so uh, this was a very popular beer. We, I also had uh, private label wines. Um, my favorite was um, Snaggletooth Red. Uh, and I, had, I did a drawing of a dog with a kind of snaggletooth sticking out, you know. So uh, anyway, moving along. Uh, here are my kids, uh, Grace and Lawrence. They were two and four when I started the re restaurant. And they would get dressed up in costumes and go out front to try and lure, you know, customers, you know, into, <laughs> into the restaurant. Um, so, uh, but I have their picture here because um, I think it's important, uh, this idea uh, of working um, and living in the same community. Like for me, it was all in the same building. We lived upstairs. But even just living in the same community makes such a difference to dedicate yourself to that community, uh, not have two different community associations, you know, waste your time on uh, uh, commuting, uh, two different you know, taxes, all this kind of stuff. Um, so uh, I lived upstairs, but more importantly, um, I think it changed my business perspective uh, because uh, living and working in the same community, you see every day uh, the people affected uh, by your business decisions, whether they're your customers or the, 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 the parents of your children's friends, your employees, um, your natural environment, your man-made uh, man -made environment, all affected by your decisions. Um, so having a short distance between me as the business decision maker and those affected by my decisions helped me to make decisions with a balance of the head and the heart. Uh, oftentimes in business schools, we're told, leave your values at home you know, when you go to work. Um, so it's uh, teach your children the golden rule when you're at home. But once you get to work, gold rules. We make decisions from the head uh, about uh, a profit, uh, as opposed to how uh, our decisions affect others uh, in our natural environment. Uh, so I'll give you some examples of some of the decisions that I made uh, that were um, a result of my relationship, my direct uh, relationship uh, with those affected by the decisions. Um, the person on the, on the right is Greg Coleman, a longtime dishwasher at the White Dog. This uh, photograph was actually taken in Havana, Cuba, because we had an international sister restaurant program, and we would bring our staff and customers to uh, restaurants in different countries. And, um, th 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 he decided he wanted to go into the kitchen and help the Cuban dishwasher wash dishes. I think it's because she was a pretty cute dishwasher. Uh, but I have his picture here because uh, I want to tell you a story. Um, I, went into, uh, I went to a business conference where they talked about a living wage. Uh, and I never heard about this before. Uh, but a living wage is the voluntary commitment on the part of a business owner to pay not the required by law minimum wage, but uh, what it actually costs to live in a particularly, particular community. Um, and so I thought, well, that's really a sweet idea, but it would never work uh, for restaurants. I, how could I pay entry-level dishwashers a living wage? This doesn't work for me. Um, but then one day I was in the kitchen, and Greg and two other dishwashers who were peeling carrots or potatoes or whatever happened to look up at me at the same time. And all of a sudden, the light bulb just went off in my head. And I'm thinking, what am I been thinking? Of course I want anyone that works for me 40 hours a week uh, to be able to pay their rent and buy their food and buy their clothes and so on. Of course I want to pay a living wage. Um, so we went about doing that. Uh, but it was really because of my personal relationship uh, with my staff and wanting them to have a good life. And so many times uh, CEOs live so far away from those affected by their decisions, whether it's the environment, their employees, or whatever, uh, that they make decisions simply by the bottom line, by looking at the papers, you know, about their profit and loss statements and so on. So another example is my relationship with nature. I had heard about uh, climate change back um, in the 90s, and we started having programs at the White Dog on climate change about 1998. Um, I knew intellectually uh, what the problem was. I knew that in Pennsylvania, we were deregulated, uh, along with California, the first states to be deregulated, uh, that renewable energy was available to us. Uh, but yet, I wasn't motivated to make the change. 
until uh, there was a drought uh, in Pennsylvania. And I drove up to the place that I love to, to hike in the woods in the Pocono Mountains and saw the effect of the drought on uh, the woods that I cared about, how the leaves were beginning to drop off the tops of the trees, even though it was just late July. Um, the ferns on Fern Hill that usually are tall and lush and green and waving the breeze were all crumpled up like brown tissue paper on the floor of the forest. And as I walked along, there was just a crackling of the sticks. The creek was all dried up with just dust on the rocks. And uh, it was just an eerie silence. Not even the birds were singing. And the, the fear of fire like was in the air. I could just feel it. Uh, and I thought, oh my gosh, I get it now. This is what climate change is about. It's about uh, parts of the world having droughts and fires and other parts storms and floods. And of course, we've seen over these last 15 years that that's exactly what has happened in increasing intensity, uh, weather weirdness. Um, so I just went over to um, a tree. I became a tree hugger. And I put my arms around a big oak tree and pressed my face against the bark and promised that I would go back to Philadelphia and uh, sign up for renewable energy. Uh, so the White Dog became the first business in Pennsylvania to buy 100% of our electricity from renewable sources. Um, so, but that came about because of my, uh, my relationship um, with nature. Uh, another example is my relationship with my community. I was stopped at a red light uh, at a, in front of a public school about 10 blocks from um, where I lived and so was, wa was watching the children come out of the, of the high school and thinking to myself, this is the school where my kids would go uh, if I didn't s uh, send them to a private Quaker school. And I don't know these kids. I don't know anything about them, yet they're in my local school. So I went in and talked to the principal and we started a mentoring program at the White Dog uh, for kids in the high school that wanted to go into the restaurant business or hotel management and so on. And we ran that program for 15 years until I sold the restaurant in 2009. This is a picture that we took the kids out to um, the farm, a farm where we bought things from. And each year we'd have another uh, group of um, 11th graders. So in each of these uh, three examples, uh, paying a living wage, signing up for renewable energy, starting a mentoring program uh, for kids in my community, uh, were examples of how I made decisions with a balance of the head and the heart. Uh, they weren't decisions that made me the most money uh, in the short term, uh, uh, but in the long term, uh, I feel like they paid off for me. Uh, they were decisions that I made um, w with a balanced perspective. Uh, so, what's next here? Another challenge for me in the uh, business world was the mantra, grow or die. Another thing we learn in business schools, you have to continue to grow your business bigger and bigger, do a chain or whatever. People would say, well, how many white dogs do you have? And I'd say, well, just one. Uh, and so I thought, am I a big sissy because I'm not taking offers to start a white dog in New York City or DC and have a national chain and so on? Uh, but I realized that uh, what really mattered to me, what made me happy uh, in business life was the relationships I had. And that if I uh, started a chain, it would weaken the authenticity of the relationships I had with my customers and my suppliers, my employees and so on. So I made a conscious decision uh, to stay small, uh, to be a community-based business. And uh, so instead of uh, starting a white dog cafe in someone else's community, I looked to see what did my uh, community need. Uh, and so I started a black hat, uh, which was a retail store um, selling uh, fair trade and locally made products. There was no store like that in my community that had responsible uh, gifts. Uh, so I started the black hat which uh, uh, occupied two of the row houses and uh, added about $500,000 you know, to our uh, sales and also uh, was a, a resource and an amenity uh, to our neighborhood that brought more, more customers onto the block. Uh, there's a picture of the inside. Uh, some people pointed out that the shelving kind of looks like a grown-up uh, free people store uh, <laughs> with more sophisticated uh, boxes. <laughs> Uh, so I began to see that um, chains are like invasive species. You know, they go into other people's communities and smother out, you know, the indigenous local businesses. Um, and so I, that made me think, okay, well then, how does nature grow? What is the healthy way to grow a business? Um, so um, I, I, I saw how nature grows is to grow in an ecosystem, not to become an invasive species, but to grow in your own ecosystem to become more complex, more diverse, more resilient, and more adaptive to the needs of your ecosystem, of the other organisms in your, in your system or, or in your community. Um, so that's how I grew the White Dog Cafe. And I'll give you some examples of that. 
Uh, but I realized that we can grow in, in ways that are not material, that we can grow by increasing our knowledge, by expanding our consciousness, by deepening our relationships, by developing our creativity, building community, and having more fun. So that's what I did at the White Dog. Um, we would have table talks at dinner or breakfast on issues of public concern, uh, which we announced in our newsletter. So people came there not just for uh, good food because they wanted to be part of something bigger than themselves, you know, to talk about um, foreign policy or drug policy reform or uh, public education or local arts and culture. Uh, here's Patch Adams, at one of our breakfast talks, uh, the, the uh, doctor who uh, talks about how humor is an important part of healing. Uh, we had a storytelling series of giving voice to underrepresented uh, populations. We had a series called Tales from Jails of ex-offenders telling their stories. Uh, this is a, 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 a storytelling on same-sex marriage with a gay couple and a lesbian uh, couple uh, telling their stories. Uh, we did community tours. Uh, this is a community garden tour. Uh, we did wall mural tours and um, uh, eco tours every spring with s looking at solar houses or whatever. Uh, we did affordable, had an affordable housing tour. Uh, we also had special events uh, that were traditional we had each year. The first special event I did was a Martin Luther King dinner on Martin Luther King Day. And we did that every year. Um, it was the first event I had and the last one that I had when I sold the business in 09. That's my little daughter, Grace, there. Uh, and we had an uh, African-American minister that kind of a, gave a, uh, a talk at the, at the dinner. And we all talked about how uh, Dr. King's work affected our own lives and how we were carrying on the dream. Uh, we did a, a, a Seder, um, uh, free, we called it a Freedom Seder that we had each spring. Uh, we also had a community um, service day. This is uh, feeding people with AIDS. After Katrina, we took a group of 30 customers and staff down to New Orleans to uh, gut houses. And we had a lot of fun. Uh, on New Year's Day, we had a pajama party brunch. Uh, in the summertime, we had these great block parties, Noche Latina, Rum and Reggae, Bastille Day party. And uh, this was one of my favorites, uh, the Liberty and Justice for All Ball on the eve of uh, Fourth of July. And we would have a, a banquet of uh, farm fresh food for dinner. And then after dinner, I put on a little skit called Birth of a Nation. And here's my bed out here where I'm going to give birth. And uh, my mother told me one time, uh, very in an embarrassed way, she whispered to me that I was conceived in this bed, you know, which was a big surprise to me. It was in my grandmother's house, but it was my, my father's bedroom. And I guess my parents lived with my, with my grandparents when they first got married. But anyway, um, so uh, first came out the Revolutionary War uh, drummer in our little skit. Uh, then I appeared as a pregnant colonial woman, uh, led by my midwife. On my back, I had a sign, <laughs> George Washington slept here. My midwife helped me into bed. And then she uh, turned to the audience and said, one, two, three, push. And everybody yelled, push. And under the covers, I pushed the, uh, the beach ball down through a hidden hole uh, in the bed under the covers. And my midwife uh, delivered my twins. Here's my first twin, <laughs> my second twin. One's called Liberty, the other Justice. They hopped up on the stage and did a tap dance to Yankee Doodle Dandy. <laughs> <laughs> then we all, uh, then we, out came the Statue of Liberty. There's my daughter Grace again. And we lit our sparklers and sang God Bless America. So that was just a lot of fun. And sometimes when people say, well, what is the most fun you ever had in your life? I would always think of my block parties. Uh, just being out on the street and looking around and dancing and uh, seeing my family, my friends, my customers, my neighbors, all having a good time. And I think so often in our contemporary society, we think that we have to spend a lot of money and a lot of carbons to fly to Hawaii or some exotic place to have a good time. Uh, when really we can have more fun in our own community uh, where we can deepen relationships and build community uh, rather than going off and being with total strangers that we'll never see again. Uh, so uh, uh, I'll read it one more little uh, passage uh, for this section. Through our many educational programs, special events, and sustainable practices, I was engaged in all these alternative ways to grow at the White Dog Cafe and Black Hat, and in helping my customers as well as interested staff grow with me. 
Financial sustainability was an important factor in serving all of our stakeholders, from suppliers to investors. But ultimately, we measured our success not simply by profits and continued material growth, but by the continued growth of happiness and well-being of our customers, employees, community, and natural world. I felt as though I had reinvented growth in a way that worked for me and worked for the planet and the people around me too. So I mentioned earlier our International Sister Restaurant um, Program. I had this uh, dream of uh, going into a restaurant. Instead of asking for a table for two or a table for four, I said, I would like a table for five billion, please, imagining a world where everyone had a place at the table financially and uh, politically, and everyone had enough to eat. Um, so that became the name of our International Sister Restaurant Program. We had to change it to uh, six billion, and if we thought it today, it would be seven billion. But uh, nevertheless, our idea was to um, uh, understand um, the effect of U.S. foreign policy on the lives of people in different countries. Uh, this was our a Vietnamese sister restaurant owner, uh, Madame Dai. Um, she had a restaurant in Saigon. And of course, at the time, uh, the U.S. had an economic embargo against Vietnam that we continued after the war. Uh, we continued really an economic war against Vietnam, uh, which is totally unfair. Um, so we worked to have that lifted. And actually, Clinton uh, did lift it during his uh, tenure. Um, so uh, we had uh, restaurants, uh, relationships with restaurants in different countries. This was um, Cuba. Uh, El Bambu is a vegetarian restaurant in Havana. Uh, there's Greg, the dishwasher. Naomi, she worked in the office. Uh, on the end is uh, a farmer uh, who um, came with us to uh, see about the community gardens of Cuba um, and how they were so advanced in their organic um, practices. The whole, the whole island is basically uh, organic, and they're known for their community gardens. But uh, one of the countries that I learned the most from was um, Mexico and, and Chiapas. Uh, and I was very curious of why did the Zapatistas have their uprising on the day that NAFTA went into effect, January 1st, 1994, almost exactly 20 years ago. Um, and I ended up going down to Chiapas uh, 10 times over a 10-year period uh, working on some economic development uh, programs. Uh, but I uh, learned from the Zapatistas that the um, reason for their uprising uh, was because they were demanding uh, local self-reliance. And I had never heard or thought about local self-reliance. Um, th they said that they predicted uh, that when NAFTA went into effect and the border between Mexico and the United States was weakened, that subsidized corn grown by large corporate corn growers, subsidized by our tax dollars through the Farm Bill, uh, would be dumped into Mexico, putting out of business the indigenous uh, corn farmers um, uh, in, uh, in their who are selling corn in their domestic market. Um, so. Um, their, their, their prediction was true. That's what happened. Um, they went out, many people, um, farmers went out of business, and that's what caused the, the, the huge increase in illegal immigration uh, to the states. Uh, but we don't really talk about how our own policies uh, create uh, what we consider uh, to be problems. So the Zapatistas um, demanded their right uh, to grow their own corn, uh, to uh, grow their own food, um, their beans, and squash and um, all their different crops to feed their own families, uh, as they had done for thousands of years. Um, they demanded the right to teach their own children in their own languages with their own values. They demanded the right to maintain their own culture and not be sucked into the global monoculture of Western wife, uh, lifestyle, which they f felt was very wasteful. Uh, they wanted to dress in their traditional way uh, with the, cl the clothes uh, that were woven by uh, the women for, again, for thousands of years, really. Um, and they didn't want to be uh, driven off the farms to work in maquiladoras, the sweatshops along the border uh, with the United States, to make cheap clothes uh, to be sent to us. Um, they uh, did not want to become part of that global economy, and that's, of course, what's happened all over the world of people being forced off the farms and into the factories to make cheap stuff that benefit others and losing the joy of their life and their communities. Um, so in the beginning, I, I was thinking that I was going to Chiapas to help the, the, um, the farmers and others in Chiapas, but then I began to draw uh, the connection between the farmers of Chiapas and the farmers uh, in Pennsylvania, where I live. This is Farmer Glenn uh, from Green Meadow Farm, one of the suppliers of the white dog. And I uh, saw about how our own farmers uh, in the United States were being driven off the land, uh, again, by uh, the policies of the Farm Bill that uh, make an unlevel playing field by giving subsidies to the big growers uh, rather than to the small 
uh, organic growers that are feeding local populations. Um, so um, I could see that we were losing our self-reliance, uh, not only with the Zapatistas losing theirs, but their, their, their call uh, of no mas, no more, um, was really the cry of people around the world, um, or should be. Uh, because we are all losing our, our, our local self-reliance. All of us uh, around the world, we're beco becoming dependent on large multinational corporations to, to fly in our food, you know, to fly in or ship in, you know, our uh, energy, our oil, uh, coal or whatever. Um, and that we were losing, um, um, losing our, our, our self-reliance. We were becoming dependent on large corporations. So uh, I envisioned a new global economy that rather than a global economy that was controlled by large multinationals shipping commodities around the world, and there's been studies done to show that in many cases the same amount of product that's shipped out of a country or out of a county uh, is the same amount that's then brought back in, whether it's beer or bottled water or pork or potatoes. Um, it's often uh, th that uh, people in farm country um, lose all the products that's all shipped out immediately uh, to someplace else, and then you buy, uh, the, the food is processed somewhere else, and then you buy it back you know, into your community. Uh, I don't know if that ever happens in Montana, that all the beef is shipped out, and then you end up buying beef uh, that was actually grown here, but you're buying it from some company in Chicago or whatever. Um, so that doesn't make any sense, and what it's doing is it's robbing our communities um, of wealth. Um, and so I envisioned a new global economy that would be a network of uh, self-reliant local economies that were self-reliant in basic needs of uh, food, shelter, clothing, and energy. Um, and then uh, uh, traded globally um, uh, our excess. Uh, I'm sure you have, uh, if you feed all this population in Montana, all the beef you can possibly eat, there's still going to be more beef, which you then would export uh, to bring in other products that you don't make here. Um, and also we would um, export uh, things, you know, products that our local entrepreneurs innovate, you know, a, a new invention, a special cheese or wine or fashion or um, artwork, um, all the things that celebrate what it is to be human that we, uh, for a time unknown, have traded, you know, with other communities. Uh, but it's based about the uniqueness of a particular region. You know, what, are, what is Montana known for? Uh, what is Pennsylvania known for that we can uh, ship to others? Um, so with this in mind, um, I started Bali, the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, with, with friends of mine from Social Venture Network, where Don and I belong. Um, and um, the main idea of Bali is, is to connect the, uh, these three things. We, we're not a, um, a top-down organization. We're very much about a network of bottoms up. Uh, we believe that the solutions to creating a new economy uh, are at the grassroots level. So what we do um, is, is act like uh, as a conduit to, to connect uh, communities. So we connect the leaders uh, and local um, economic movements. Uh, we spread the solutions of th something that works well uh, in Philadelphia, might work well in San Francisco or whatever. We have an annual conference, which uh, this year um, is in Oakland in June. Uh, the website is bealocalist.com, uh, bealocalist.com. Um, and we, we drive investment, uh, driving investment from the stock market uh, into local investment. Uh, because when our money is invested in the stock market, uh, it's perpetuating um, a, a, an economy of publicly traded companies, and the mission of publicly traded companies is to um, provide the highest, uh, to maximize profits for their stockholders, um, and uh, you know, at, often at the expense of the environment and the employees and, and so on. Um, so um, we try to uh, encourage people to disinvest in the stock market. I, I did that um, in 1990. Nine, when my mother passed away and I inherited stock and I looked at my portfolio and there was GE and all these horrible companies and so I first I thought I will do um, screen funds, you know, uh, invest in screen funds so that uh, weapons and um, tobacco and animal cruelty, whatever would be screened out, but then I opened my portfolio and there was Walmart, you know. So I realized that I didn't want to be invested in any publicly traded company that was against my values uh, to put profit uh, before people on planet. Um, so I took all my money uh, out of the stock market and invested every penny uh, into a local financial institution called the Reinvestment Fund, uh, which works in my 
in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and, and um, New Jersey. Um, and I found that the wind turbines that I bought my energy from for the White Dog were capitalized uh, through the investment fund. Um, so uh, I, I realized that when you invest locally, you get not only a financial return, but a living return, uh, the benefit of living in a more sustainable, prosperous, happy um, community uh, in, your, in, your own, uh, in your own region. Oh, here's, uh, this, is at, uh, this is the back of the napkin business plan contest winners uh, at the Bali conference. I think this was in, in Buffalo uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, meanwhile, back at home, I was building a network of uh, local farmers who were supplying the white dog. This is uh, Judy and Mark Dornstripe from Branch Creek Farm that made incredible, uh, these are heirloom uh, tomatoes. And Mark uh, once commented to me that successful farming is the balance of feminine energy and masculine energy, uh, of efficiency and nurturing. That he as a farmer had to balance those two things. Um, if he had um, too much efficiency and not enough nurturing, he, he was using his time wisely and running a great business, but he wasn't going to have a good product. On the other hand, if he had too much nurturing and not enough efficiency, he might have great tomatoes, but he's going to go out of business because he's not using his time wisely. He's not running a good, efficient uh, business. So it's that balance of the two energies. It has nothing to do with gender. It's the masculine and the feminine that's in each of us, men and women, both. So it got me thinking about how our whole economy is out of balance. balance. There's too much masculine energy, too much um, uh, head, um, decision from the head as opposed to f from the heart. Too much efficiency and not enough nurturing. And probably the, some of the worst examples are in um, and, uh, industrial agriculture, uh, in particular the, um, oops, there we go. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. There we go. Uh, in particular, um, uh, CAFOs, the confinement um, of animals in, in, in these little cages. Here's a battery cages of hens. Uh, and here the name of the game is all about efficiency. How little space can we give that hen? How little food can we give her? How little light, how little air to make the cheapest possible egg possible, you know? So there's no thought about the hen, no thought about nurturing. It's all about efficiency. And so at the White Dog, um, we bought only uh, uh, chickens that were raised out in pasture and cage-free eggs, and I've made that commitment in my personal life only to uh, uh, eat animals when I do eat animals that are raised in a, in a healthy uh, way and respectful way. Uh, then I found out about the, the horrible, uh, barbaric way in which mother sows are raised in our industrial system. Uh, like the hens, they're kept in these cages. Uh, they can't take a step forward or backward their entire life. Um, ha uh, pigs are very intelligent animals. They say they have the same intelligence as, as a three-year-old child. They go insane uh, not being able to do anything. Their whole lives are artificially inseminated. Their babies are taken away prematurely, artificially inseminated again. As they, they're pieces of machinery in a factory, uh, never feeling um, sunshine or fresh air, uh, never being able to sleep in big pig piles as they like to do. Um, and, you know, pigs are mammals, um, like our dogs, like us, and all mammals are, have the capacity for emotions, uh, for love, uh, especially of, of the young, of joy, of despair, um, of guilt. Um, you've seen these expressions on your dog's faces. If a, the dog steals a little piece of sausage off the coffee table, you get that little look of guilt in the face, you know, uh, or the joy when you're going to go for a walk, or the sadness when you're going to leave. Um, mammals have feelings, um, and here are these uh, intelligent, sentient beings uh, kept in this way. So I was just, I, I, I couldn't believe this, you know, when I heard about this. I read uh, John Robbins' book, A Diet for New America, and so I realized that the pork I was serving at the White Dog came from the system, because unless you know otherwise, that's where pork in this country comes from. Um, so I finally just walked into the restaurant and said, take all the pork off the menu. You know, the bacon, the pork chops, the ham, that we cannot be a part of this horrible barbaric system, that this is a, a violation of nature, you know, to treat these mothers in this way. Uh, it's, a, it's a breach of our fiduciary duty as stewards, you know, of the farm animals to treat them with kindness and respect. Um, so uh, we went about finding a source for pastured pork, and here's a picture of an Amish farmer with a big mother sow. Um, and uh, it's just a joy to see her walking across the field with the little babies trotting along behind and making her, building her own nest in the straw here. Here's how pigs like to sleep in the mud and the sunshine. And, and then I found out about the plight of the cow. I'm sure you know about that, being in, in Montana, how because, again, of our, our farm bill uh, provides cheap grains uh, 
cows are taken off pasture and, and fed grain. And cows are herbivores. They're not supposed to eat grain. Uh, their natural diet is grass and clover and all this. Uh, but it's cheaper uh, because due to our tax dollars uh, subsidizing the grain um, to take the cattle off pasture and put them in stockyards uh, or in barns and just feed them grain all the time, uh, which is not good for the animal and it's not good for us to eat uh, the meat or drink the milk um, of uh, animals, of cows that are raised on pasture. That marbled beef that we're taught to think that that's the best kind of beef is actually bad for us. Uh, it causes a heart disease and whatnot. So anyway, uh, I could go on and on about uh, all the health hazards of both, you know, for the raising of the pigs and the beef and so on that affect us and our health. And I think we're, you know, on the verge of um, major health problems with the confinement farming of animals because of the intensity of the confinement. They are fed antibiotics um, every day, which is making, creating these superbugs that are resistant to um, uh, antibiotics uh, that cannot, people are getting these staph infections that cannot be cured. People are dying from this and it's going to get worse. And of course, we know that hormones are affecting um, puberty, you know, with youth and so on. But anyway, so we, we found a source for grass-fed beef in our community. This is a herd of Black Angus and Dr. Bill Elkins who uh, raises uh, this beef and uh, we used only grass-fed beef, um, totally grass-fed, not even grain finished. Um, and we did, uh, we made uh, grass-fed hamburgers that were so popular that um, a famous singer, Patti LaBelle, uh, would stop in her limo and came, come in and, and get a uh, grass-fed burger. Uh, it was Dr. Bill's Buck Run Farm Burgers. Uh, here's Dougie. Uh, she's the one that kisses her goat's ears. Um, so I finally got to the point where I looked at my menu and thought, gee, you've finally done it. You know, uh, we have a menu that's cruelty free, you know, unless you're a vegetarian or vegan or whatever, but all of our meat and poultry um, was from farms that were uh, humane and raised animals with respect. Um, and uh, this was going to be our market niche. There was no other restaurant in Philadelphia uh, that was doing this. Uh, this was our, our competitive advantage. Um, and then um, I thought to myself, well, gee, if you really do care about those pigs, you know, and the other farm animals, if you care about the environment where um, 10,000 sows in one barn, for instance, with all that manure, you know, going into the lagoon that then goes and pollutes the, the water and the air and the soil in a rural community, uh, if you care about the small farmers being driven out of business and the workers in these horrible slaughterhouses and factory farms, and uh, if you care about um, uh, the consumers that are eating meat that's full of hormones and antibiotics, then rather than keeping this as your market niche, your competitive advantage, you'll share these sources with your competitors. So that was a transformational moment for me. Uh, up until that time, I thought the best thing I could possibly do was to have good values uh, within my uh, company. Uh, to recycle and buy local and sign up for renewable energy, all these kinds of things that, what more could I do? Uh, but then I realized that if we, if we are going to create a new economy, uh, and if we don't, quite frankly, civilization is not going to last that much longer, um, uh, that we need to work in cooperation. Um, that there is no such thing as one sustainable business. We can only be part of a sustainable system and that we need to cooperate uh, to build that sustainable system. So, um, uh, and this movement for me from being a competitive business person uh, to being a cooperative one uh, was just changed my life. Uh, I kept thinking of more ways that I could share and cooperate and, and uh, one of them was to start uh, White Dog Community Enterprises, 501c3. And I must say that at that point, I, my kids had already gone through college, I paid all the, t the college tuitions, my mortgage was paid off um, and I was making an adequate salary. I didn't need to... Um, uh, make more and more uh, money. Um, and so I decided to put 20% of my profits uh, into a nonprofit uh, and use that money to start some uh, various programs. I asked um, Glenn, uh, our farmer who is bringing us in two pigs, we had to use the whole animal because um, that's better for the farmer and respectful for the pig, using all the parts of the pig, pulled pork sandwiches in the bar and sausages and so on. So I asked uh, uh, Glenn if he'd like to expand his business and he said yes. And I said, well, what's holding you back? And he said he needed $30,000 so he could buy a refrigerated truck and then he could deliver to many uh, restaurants when he came into town. So I loaned him the $30,000. In this picture, this is the dance of the ripe tomatoes where you have these, these big tomatoes and, and uh, we, it's a celebration of uh, humane and sustainable farming. But anyway, so, so um, uh, Glenn uh, bought the truck and uh, expanded his business and since has paid me back the, the $30,000. 
Uh, then we started the Fair Food Project, uh, which was the first project of uh, White Dog Community Enterprises, and it was the job of Fair Food to go to the, around to the other restaurants and give them a list of all the farmers that the White Dog bought from, what each farm carried, their phone number and so on, what the de delivery days were. Um, and that beca uh, eventually became a, a, a published uh, wholesale guide, and then we also started a local food guide, and Fair Food is now uh, thir 13 years old, four almost 14 years old. Uh, we started a farm stand that's um, seven days a week, um, year-round farm stand in indoors. At, a, at our market, and we represent 90 producers, um, b both uh, farmers that uh, pr provide raw products, but also uh, local food enterprises that process food into energy bars, you know, yogurt, cheese, bread. Uh, we have our own crackers now in Philadelphia, so we can have local cheese with local crackers. We have local martinis. We brew or distill our own uh, vodka and gin and rum now. Uh, very proud of that, as well as, of course, all of our local beers. Uh, the second um, project I started out of White Dog was Sustainable Business Network, which is like uh, Sustainable Business Council here uh, in Missoula. We now have over 400 members. Um, and through the business networks, we look at ways that we can cooperate uh, with each other. Uh, another thing, and by the way, uh, cooperation is uh, inherent in nature. Uh, for many, many years, scientists said that nature is basically uh, competitive. Uh, kind of the uh, Darwinian uh, theory that's the survival of the fittest, uh, that you kind of fight to the death to survive. Uh, in the last 15 years, scientists have uh, now agreed that nature is basically cooperative, that nature, uh, that uh, different species and organisms actually cooperate with other ones uh, in order to grow, um, and that the human mind, the human brain, is wired uh, towards cooperation and sharing. Um, and so, um, we also uh, know that there is no waste in nature. And so we started a, a composting uh, project because uh, in the restaurant business, one of the things that's wasted are, uh, is food. Uh, any food that's edible, we give to the homeless shelters, but uh, all the, you know, the peels off things and chopping stuff up and whatever and the scraps off the plates uh, go into um, a communal earth tub. And those, uh, containers on the side. There's one for each restaurant. Uh, we had five restaurants on our block, so we started a, a kind of a collective of the restaurants to uh, gather all the compost and put them in this communal earth tub. And then once the um, uh, compost was ready, uh, we gave it to um, community gardens uh, uh, within the city of Philadelphia. Uh, another waste that we had was fry oil, and so Farmer Glenn would c collect all the fry oil, uh, starting with the White Dog, but eventually many other restaurants, and then he would take the, the fry oil back to his farm and heat his greenhouses with used fry oil. And eventually he ran his whole farm on fry oil, his tractor, his car, heated his home, his barns, uh, greenhouses and everything uh, with uh, our waste, the waste from the restaurants. Uh, so that's a very important part of nature, that there is no waste, that there's a complete cycle. Um, here's a, uh, a board meeting of our Sustainable Business Network up in the, in the woods, in the wiki-wacky woods. And one of the great things about uh, this work uh, is the collective joy uh, that we feel in having a shared vision uh, for, our, for our community. Um, and let me just read a, a passage here. As I see it, greed and violence often come from a lack of faith. Faith as I saw in the Eskimo village that the universe is abundant and can provide for everyone if we're willing to share, cooperate, and live in harmony with all of life. In working towards such a world, local living economies are shifting consciousness by modeling these values and demonstrating that our real security, as well as our happiness, lies in strong, self-reliant communities within a healthy web of life. By building a new global economy in which every community has food and water security and locally produced renewable energy, we are creating the foundation for world peace. We can reinvent what it is to be an American. Rather than a country of rugged individuals, we can be a country of rugged communities. Perhaps we always have been. So the time came when um, I needed to sell the, the white dog. I became so involved with all my nonprofit work um, that the relationships that I was so proud of um, began to, to weaken, not enough that our customers would really notice, but I noticed. And so I decided that I, something had to give. I either had to give up my nonprofit work or sell the restaurant. And I decided that I, I didn't want to go back to like working full time on the restaurant. I was, at that point, I'd been in restaurant management for 40 years. And uh, I was in my 60s, and so it was time to 
uh, do something different. Uh, but the thing I was most worried about was maintaining the values uh, that the white dog was known for. Um, so. Um, uh, around that time, the trademark White Dog Cafe came up for renewal. Um, and so rather than keeping it in the uh, ownership of the corporation, I put it into my uh, name personally. So I own the name White Dog Cafe. So when I sold uh, the White Dog, I didn't sell the name. I continued to own the name. And I licensed the name uh, to the new owners uh, with a social contract. Um, and the social contract outlines all the uh, business practices uh, that I wanted to maintain. So um, in order to use the name White Dog Cafe, you can only serve humanely raised meat, um, uncaged eggs, uh, use renewable energy, uh, only uh, buy fair trade uh, chocolate, coffee, tea, vanilla, cinnamon, and so on. So all these uh, uh, values are baked into the name. Uh, and that is going to last for 15 years. Uh, at the end of 15 years, they own the name, but I'm hoping in 15 years that all the things that I'm asking for will become mainstream. Uh, and already um, in Philadelphia, all the better restaurants uh, do serve pastured pork and free-range chicken and grass-fed beef and uncaged eggs and so on. So that part is becoming mainstream. And uh, if, you're, if you want to be a good restaurant in Philadelphia, you have to do those things. So I'm hoping um, by the end of 15 years that it would also be the case that um, responsible places will all be signed up for renewable energy and, and fair trade and so on. So I want to end uh, with this slide uh, because I want to go back to um, the idea that what really drives this movement um, is love and compassion. Uh, when I made the decision to buy renewable energy, even though it was going to cost more money, I didn't do that because I thought, oh, this is the right thing to do. I did that because I love the woods. I love nature. And I could see what was happening to the world that I love. And that's why I signed up for renewable energy. Um, the same thing when I decided to share with my competitors and start the, the local food movement in my community and the local living economy movement. Um, I was motivated uh, because of my love for the pigs. You know, it wasn't just, you know, thinking, oh, I'm going to do the right thing. It wasn't an intellectual decision. It was a decision from the heart. Um, and I feel oftentimes in this uh, society of ours uh, that consumerism has caused us to have hardened hearts, that we don't want to hear about it. We don't want to hear about where, uh, you know, the food that we're eating and where it comes from. We don't want to hear about uh, what goes into making a fur coat. Uh, we don't want to hear about the fact that chocolate is, uh, cocoa beans are often grown by slave labor, and that we have to make sure that we buy only fair trade chocolate. Uh, but for the most part, we don't want to hear about that. Um, and, you know, I feel like the answer to all this is to really to open our hearts, you know, to hear the cry of the pigs in the cages and the, and the hens and to hear the call of the um, people working in sweatshops and the diamond mines and uh, the people that live in countries where oil is being drilled in Iraq and Nigeria and so on, uh, to realize that our economic transactions uh, affect the lives of other people uh, and animals and nature. Um, and that if we want to protect what we truly care about, uh, including our children and the future of our children, uh, that will make decisions in the best interest of our children uh, and the children of all species. So I'll end there. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have time for questions, or? Uh, sure. How about just a couple? A couple questions? A couple questions? Anybody have a burning question they want to ask? Yeah. Yes? What you've done is truly extraordinary. Uh, a lot of us in the room have started and owned and run businesses, and you can speak for many of us, and I say it's a real struggle to get it off the ground and get it going. What did you do? Like, what's your secret sauce here? What do you know that you don't know that made you so successful? What's it that set you apart and allowed you to create everything? <coughs> Well, I think there are a lot of factors. I think it's, uh, as I mentioned before, it's really important to live and work in the same community so you don't waste time with commuting. Uh, you can really focus and build the relationships in your community. Um, as I, when I started the White Dog, I had never heard of sustainability or fair trade or um, living wage. I didn't hear, uh, even responsible business. I, I only wanted to start 
uh, a business that was uh, a place where my friends could come and gather and eat um, wholesome food and, and have good conversations. That's about all I knew. So my, really my business taught me. Uh, and as I learned things or read about things, um, I applied them, you know, whether it was the living wage or, you know, renewable energy or putting uh, solar hot water on my roof or whatever. Um, I wanted to model these practices. Um, I think, you know, to tell you the truth, a little bit of his um, timing, you know, um, the local food movement hadn't started when I, uh, when I began my restaurant. I wanted to buy local food because that's what I learned as a child. Um, my parents had a vegetable garden and uh, we ate from the garden or we went to the local farmers to buy things. And I was in a French restaurant for 10 years with heavy sauces and imported ingredients. And so I, you know, I came up with the idea of American food uh, that was locally grown, thinking this was um, what I, I wanted, and if I wanted it, that my friends might want it. Um, I have the advantage of being a baby boomer, so we have the largest population bubble. Um, and so, just like the Free People store, I think that was successful, partly because we did what our generation wanted, and we were a big group. Um, it helps to be in a city where there's a lot of people. Um, of course, there's a lot of competition, <laughs> too. Um, uh, but I really do think that uh, because I, uh, and I couldn't do everything at once. Uh, you know, the restaurant was 26 years old when I sold it. So I didn't do all this stuff when I was two or three or four or five years old. Uh, it was a gradual uh, unfolding, you know, um, and as I could afford to do something more, I would do something more. Uh, but um, I, I don't want to dismiss um, the idea that we have to have a budget, you know, we have to have business sense. Uh, and when I did things like, for instance, the table talks or the community tours, I did these things on days where the white dog was, was slow. So I, I filled in those empty times on um, a Monday night with a table talk. Uh, Saturday afternoon was a slow time, so that's when we would do our tours, our affordable housing tours, our bicycle tours, uh, all the different uh, tours that we did. So there was, you know, so I had a, I had a, you know, I, I didn't, uh, I tried to do good while doing well. You know, I, I didn't, I don't feel like I made a sacrifice. Um, and I really um, just followed my passion, like what I really cared about. I mean, one of the things that was frustrating when I first got into business um, was how a business takes up all your time. You know, if you're a small business owner, especially a restaurant, you know, it's 24 hours almost. You know, the first person comes to the restaurant at five in the morning to start cleaning, and the last one leaves about three in the morning after the bar closes and they clean up. So there's very little time when there's no one there, so it's very intense. So I thought, like, well, when can I deal with all the things that I care about, you know, all the different issues that I care about? Um, so it was really a time management um, solution uh, also that I started doing these programs, because then if I cared about drug policy reform, I would have a program on that. You know, if I cared about community arts and culture, we would do a tour of community arts and culture. culture. So all the things that I cared about in my community, I was able to uh, express, you know, through my business. Um, so that built tremendous uh, community loyalty, because just about any issue that you could think about, progressive issues, uh, the white dog was acting on it in some way. Uh, and um, we had great food. You know, I'm not a chef, so I can't take credit for that, but I had a chef partner uh, who was there for, I think, 14 years, the same person, or maybe it was 17 years, I don't remember now, but um, anyway, he was an excellent chef. I made him a partner in the business, and um, so I stayed out of the kitchen. I think that was another secret to, uh, to our success, <laughs> that I was not the cook. Uh, and so I spent my creative energies, not on the food, but on all these programs, you know, um, and just filling up all our time with fun things. Fun was like a really important uh, part of the white dog. Uh, and I used to say that my, my real profession was um, using, um, uh, luring uh, customers in with our good food uh, uh, to become social activists. So my, that was my, uh, my, my real mission was to create more social activists to really create social change. <laughs> and I used uh, food to lure people into that. Um, so, um, you know, uh, what can I say? We succeeded. I think I got out of business at the right time because the recession had just started. Um, so I felt very fortunate that I was able to sell my business. Um, and, you know, uh, I own the real estate. 
Uh, that was another secret to my success. Uh, if you're in a place-based business like a restaurant, uh, by all means try to buy the property if there's any possible way to do it. Because if you don't, you're going to get screwed. Because the better you do, uh, the more the real estate is worth and the more your rent's going to go up. Uh, I've heard so many stories about successful restaurants having to, to close because the owner of the real estate made the rent so high that they, they couldn't make it. Um, so I had a, a lot of good fortune along the way. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it was really mostly about um, just following my heart and uh, acting on what I really cared about. And that authenticity uh, was often unique in the business world, and my customers were, were very loyal to that. So, well, I think we're out of time, so sorry we can't have more questions. <laughs> Please do stay to talk with Judy. She'll be signing books, but I want to offer this gift basket of locally procured gifts and made gifts. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Judy. Thank you. It's lovely. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to all you. Can you stand here so I can oh, use sure. the mic? So before you oh. leave, I also want to thank Don McGee, who hosted and suggested that we bring Judy here. Thank you. <laughs> and because, because a local, thriving, vibrant economy really is a community shared cooperative enterprise, we really value our members, we value our community, we're in a growth mode, now is a really good time to join the, the Sustainable Business Council if you're not a member. We're likely to be raising our, our $120 annual dues, um, so now is a good time to join. We also has a, have a $5,000 matching gift right now, so we're a 501c3. If you um, would like to help support the development of Missoula's vibrant local economy, please um, go to our website, call us up, um, and be in touch. We want to we wanna hear from you and we want to work with you to grow this economy together. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. <laughs> That's it.